Hello my viewers and welcome back to my channel. If you are new here then don't forget to subscribe, give this video a thumbs up by tapping on the like button and feel free to be part of the conversation. You really need to be part of this conversation because this video is very interesting. Now I will come you to another video where we take a look into untold histories and surprising truths often left out of mainstream education. Now in this video we explore eye-opening facts that challenge conventional narratives and shed light on overlooked aspects of the past from the grim realities of the transatlantic slave trade and the fascinating contrast in historical hygiene practices to the hidden reasons behind educational reforms and the truth about africa's map we will uncover compelling stories that history books often miss so join me as we unravel these captivating insights and broaden our understanding of history in ways you might not expect know that this video is for educational purpose only so with that said let's get into the video as we educate one another take a look at these videos i'll be right back facts about slavery that you won't learn in school part one the enslaved africans that were captured during slavery were captured inland so about in here all the way down here then the west africans were brought to slave castles after they were captured now these slave castles acted as a holding cell for the africans until they were bought and sold once the slaves had arrived to the slave castles they had to enter through this door which is called the door of no return because once you enter through the door there was no telling when you'd be leaving but these were the holding rooms or cells that the slaves stayed in until they were bought and they typically stayed in there for up to six months there's a little hole at the roof so the slaves can have some type of sunlight and there was an area at the bottom of the floor where the slaves could use the bathroom and the gag is multiple slaves were held in there at once but it gets worse since they were captured from various spots in africa a lot of them didn't speak the same language to make it harder for them to communicate many died and got sick from being held in this room did you know that american colonists were so stinky that native people could smell them a mile away okay that was a slight exaggeration but their hygiene was very bad 17th century europeans did not regularly participate in full immersion bathing instead they washed their face and hands at a basin each day and believed that washing their linen undergarments was enough to keep their body clean native americans bathed regularly in open rivers and streams and even their oral hygiene was superior they used things like chew sticks mint and charcoal to keep their teeth fresh and clean Many of us were taught in school that Native Americans were simply defeated by the strength of European troops, but this wasn't true. Germs killed more Native people than guns. Millions of Native people died because of the horrible diseases brought over by Europeans as a result of bad hygiene. This included diseases like smallpox. Where do you think this person is from? What about this person? Or this person? You might have guessed these people to be indigenous Australians, or perhaps people of the Pacific Islands, or even Africans. But they're actually members of various Adivasi tribes found in India. The people I showed you were specifically part of the Irula and Panya tribes. Now, according to the Out of Africa theory, humans first entered South Asia or India around 70,000 years ago. We refer to the people that formed a hunter-gatherer society in South Asia as the AASI. All South Asians partially descend from these early Homo sapiens that entered the subcontinent. Apparently around 22% of my own DNA is derived from these ancient people. But the reason these tribal communities in India are so fascinating is because up to 70% of their DNA is derived from the AASI. And so some refer to them as the indigenous people of India, a debated title. I'm glad you asked. Peter's projection. It has fidelity of axis. Fidelity of position. East-west lines are parallel and intersect north-south axes at right angles. What the hell is that? It's where you've been living this whole time. Should we continue? You're probably wondering what all of this has to do with social equality. No, I'm wondering where France really is. Mercator maps exaggerate the importance of Western civilization when the top of the map is given to the northern hemisphere and the bottom is given to the southern, then people will tend to adopt top and bottom attitudes. But wait, how? I think as Africans you realize why heaven is up and heaven is down. It's all up here, all designed by psychologists from the University of Gottingen, Germany. See, the word Bantu goes back to ancient Egypt. The word ba means to have a soul that can transfer from this plane to the next. The word Netu meant the people. Bantu meant the people, created people, original people with souls that would transfer the, from this plane to the next. You see, the Bantu, the Abba, 
aboriginal of the continent of Africa come in many different sizes, many different hues. All can be recognized by their hair, which is usually woolly, curly, and kinky. Spiral as it grows towards the sun. These people are the original people spoken of in holy scriptures. Africa was once called the land of the gods because it was where the concept of God was first created. Europe is not a continent. It's a small part of Eurasia. And yet, for the longest time, and probably up until today, you believed it. And if you talk with people outside of this gathering, and you ask them, so how many continents are there? They'll say seven, and they'll rattle it off. And then you'll say, no, Europe isn't a continent. Oh, yes, it is. Because they learned it in the fifth grade. And they learned it well, but they learned it incorrectly. There are six huge bodies of land. And you probably thought, North America, South America, blah, blah, blah. And then you get to Europe and Asia. And Europe and Asia is one landmass. Continent, I used to teach geography. A continent is a huge body of land separated from others or almost separated. Europe is not separated. But probably in school you learned that Europe and Asia are separated by the Ural Mountains. Check out Mr. Webster. He says nothing about a mountain separating continents. But we have come to believe that Europe is a continent because Europeans told us it was a continent. That in itself is part of the concept of whiteness. Europe is not a continent. I just now realized that in all of my education preparation to become a teacher, we never learned about the history of education. I actually started researching the history of education when I was researching about unschooling. For those of you that don't know, my name is Angela. I am a former public school teacher turned unschooler. And I help families live and learn with faith and freedom. I started questioning what I was doing as a teacher by reading the book Dumbing Us Down by John Taylor Gatto. I love that book so much that I decided to read other books by him. And one of the books that he wrote is An Underground History of American Education. In fact, you can actually download a free PDF of this book. I read through that whole book and became absolutely convinced that if people knew the history of American education, we would not be doing what we're doing. Like, parents would shut the whole system down. So, of course, when I was writing and publishing my own book about the American education system, called Tales of a Toxic Teacher Exposing the Cycles of Abuse Within Our Schools, you know where to find the link, I had to include one chapter about the history of American education because we can't fully understand the problems of a system until we understand the roots and the history behind that system. The system is indeed horrible. And I promise you it is worse than you could imagine. Here are some quotes from people who helped to set up our American education system. What is the purpose of industrial education? To fill the young of the species with knowledge and awaken their intelligence? Nothing could be further from the truth. The aim is simply to reduce as many individuals as possible to the same safe level, to breed and train a standardized citizenry, to put down dissent and originality. That is its aim in the United States, and that is its aim everywhere else. H.L. Mencken If the public schools can keep the children occupied throughout the day with sports after school and homework in the evening, the parents will have less than an hour a day with their children, and the families and Christian churches' influence over them could be broken in about a generation. John Dewey We who are engaged in the sacred cause of education are entitled to look upon all parents as having given hostages to our cause. Horace Mann Education should aim at destroying free will so that after pupils are thus schooled, they will be incapable throughout the rest of their lives of thinking or acting otherwise than as their schoolmasters would have wished. Johann Gottlieb Fichte. Now, according to research, Cape Coast Castle is a trading post on the West African coast in the modern nation of Ghana. It stands only a few miles from another slave castle built by the Portuguese at Elmina in the late 15th century, originally built by Sweden in the 1650s. Cape Coast Castle shifted into Danish Dutch and then English possession by the 1660s in the castle's early decades. Trade revolved around gold, wood, and textiles before English merchants began to seek captive Africans in large numbers. Large permanent 
trading factories like Cape Coast Castle gave European traders competitive advantages in the marketplace. Now, by focusing resources in and around these sites, merchants could build alliances with local political leaders to ensure steady supplies of African commodities. Now, the town that grew around the castle supplied labor to merchants, supplementing the castle's own enslaved workers. In addition, relationships between European men and African women led to a significant biracial population around Cape Coast. When Cape Coast Castle's commerce became increasingly dependent on supplying slave cargoes, the fort added dungeons to hold larger numbers of captives. In doing this, the castle's merchants could outfit ships more quickly, at higher prices and with greater profits than their smaller competitors. Now, Elmina Castle and Cape Coast Castle in Ghana are two of the principal depots, often called slave castles, that held enslaved persons from kingdoms all across Africa between the 16th and 19th century. Now, this was their final stopping point before they were loaded on two ships to cross the Atlantic Ocean, never to return to this coastline. Now, enslaved Africans were forced through the so-called door of no return at these castles, a narrow opening in the fortress wall that led to the water's edge and the nearby ships awaiting them. Now, this image of passing through a door, escaping unbelievable horrors, only to be forced to cross the Atlantic Ocean in similar inhumane conditions. Now, the door of no return was the most powerful experience for most slaves at Elmina Castle. To get there, you have to walk through the dungeons, even to the point where you have to crouch. The guide has to use a flashlight for visibility. Now, although initially built as trading centers for timber and gold, these castles would become strategic trading points in the triangle trade. This route brought goods to the West African coast, slaves to the Americas, and raw materials to Europe. Now, the Gold Coast, now present-day Ghana, got its name in the 15th century because of the gold and other valuable goods found in the area. Elmina Castle is the oldest building constructed by Europeans that is still in existence in sub-Saharan Africa. After the, the Portuguese be built the fortress in 1482, it changed ownership multiple times, falling into Dutch hands in the mid-1600s when they found it profitable to be involved in the slave trade on the Gold Coast. Now, millions of the recently enslaved awaited transport to the Americas in Elmina Castle until the Dutch ended their, their participation in the slave trade in 1814. Towards the end of the 19th century, Elmina Castle came under British colonial rule until Ghana became an independent nation in 1957. Cape Coast Castle, less than 10 miles from Elmina Castle, was also heavily used during this incredibly brutal chapter in history. Swedish traders constructed it in 1653, but after a few different owners, it fell under British control 11 years later. Now, the castle's cannons pointed at the sea and kept other traders from venturing too close to the British control castle. Many enslaved Africans passed through here on their way to British colonies in the Americas. Elmina Castle and Cape Coast Castles are just two of over 40 castles in this coast that held enslaved people on their way across the Atlantic Ocean. Around 30 still stand this day, serving as a reminder of a period that humanity should never forget. Now, coming to the not-so-hygienic personal hygiene of the 17th century, this article by Andrea Zulvich reads, Many of us in the Western world now have the luxury of bathing or showering daily. Then we apply antiperspirants and perfume. Lots of us now know that germs are easily transferable from what you touch to your body. Naturally, people like to wash their hands with soap and water in order to reduce the chances of getting sick. And I've seen many people, including myself, use hand wipes, alcohol pads, and more to get rid of dirt and germs. That wasn't the case in the 1600s. This was a time of lice, fleas, intestinal worms, plague, and pestilence. Now, the article goes on and says, nice soap was too expensive for most folks. Some people thought it was not so healthy to immerse the entire body in water. And anyway, if it's winter and you're freezing with no hot water, well, I think you get the idea. A person's hands and face were the things most likely to be cleaned daily, if possible. Some people uncomfortable with being dirty or overly smelly would wash themselves in a river or stream. And we've heard who those people were in the video. In such circumstances, nice smells were very welcome. Now, infectious diseases had a, a profound historical impact on Native American populations, beginning with the arrival of European settlers who introduced new diseases to previously naive populations. 
Now, during the initial phase of European colonization, infectious diseases were the primary analyver among Native American communities. Infections ranging from smallpox, plague, chickenpox, cholera, the common cold, influenza, malaria, measles, scarlet fever, some S transmitted disease, typhoid, and many more other diseases produced illness and extensive analyvings. Now, it is estimated that 95% of the indigenous populations in the Americas were analyved by infectious diseases during the years following European colonization, amounting to an estimated 20 million people. Now, I won't be able to comment on each and every video that I've shared, but I want you, my viewers, to share your thoughts, your views, your contributions, and what you know on what you've heard in these videos and what is being talked about. Share your thoughts in the comment section down below and let's have a conversation there. Let's educate one another. Thank you for always watching and see you in my next video as I bring you another interesting video.